Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Women for Girls. Tonight, we're featuring Jenny Johnson, uh, CEO of Franklin Templeton. This, uh, tonight's program will follow the following format. We'll have a fireside chat followed by Q&A. If you would like to ask questions of Jenny during the program, feel free to put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. There should be a, a button on the bottom panel that you can use to submit questions. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Betsy Kelder, Executive Director of Invest in Girls for her opening remarks. Betsy? Thomas, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us this evening for our Women for Girls speaker series. As Thomas said, my name is Betsy Kelder and I'm the Executive Director of Invest in Girls, a program of the Council for Economic Education. Invest in Girls is working to usher in a generation of financially literate girls and increase the number of women working in careers in finance and financial services. To grow interest in the field, you need to be shown the opportunities that exist for you and what the path to success is. Women are dramatically underrepresented in finance and lack confidence in matters of managing their own money. We are working for transformational change in these areas. Many of you are part of the workshops we teach to make sure girls have the foundational concepts of financial literacy. You may also have participated in Future Females in Finance, a career access program focused on learning the language of the industry and trying on different roles. Maybe you've been part of our mentoring program during this or a previous school year. And if you haven't been part of any or all of these, we encourage you to visit our website, investgirls.org students and sign up. Our next cohort of girls gets to start their programming in just a couple of weeks, so please do join us. Research tells us that when we see role models who look like us, we're better able to envision ourselves in those roles. This, coupled with the founding principle of IIG, an organization of women for girls, led us to create the Women for Girls speaker series, an opportunity to bring executive level women from major corporations to you, our girls, and our network to talk about their careers, lives, and learnings. I'm thrilled today to introduce our speaker, the president and CEO of Franklin Resources, Jenny Johnson. Jenny joined the company in 1988 and has held many roles at the company, uh, at Franklin Templeton. I'm not gonna bore you by reading her bio because that's why we're here, to spend some time talking with Jenny and getting to know her better. So Jenny, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thanks, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. So, um, you know, give us a little introduction to, to who you are. Um, you know, we'd love to hear a little bit more about you and, um, and start with, um, you know, what you like to do and, uh, and then we can talk about your career path. Okay. Um, so I have five kids and probably the thing that I, they're, they're old, they're 20 to 30 now, but the, uh, what I love to do is spend time with them doing anything. And, and, when I'm not with them, if I'm not working, because I love what I do as far as work, uh, I'm probably happiest riding my horse. I have a horse out in Montana and I get out there periodically and I, I absolutely feel at peace riding my horse. Excellent, excellent. So tell us a little bit about how you wound up as the president and CEO of Franklin Templeton. Um, we always love good stories about bad jobs and first jobs and, you know, things that, that you've learned along the way? So, you know, uh, Franklin Templeton was actually started by my grandfather. So probably uniquely for me, and maybe that's one of the reasons that as a woman, I'm, you know, it was helpful in getting there. I think things are changing, but uh, it was started by my grandfather. It was very small when my father took it over. It was two and a half million dollars in assets. It's not billion, that's million dollars in assets and a part-time employee. Uh, today, we have $1.5 trillion that we manage for other people, and a little over 10,000 employees were located in 30 plus countries and have clients in 165 countries. So obviously been a, been a great career path. Um, I, you know, from very young, always wanted to be part of this business for whatever reason. I actually thought finance was a great industry to be in. Uh, I think others come to that later, but for me, it was something I just uh, thought would be a nice business. I, I view it as a business that really helps people. Um, and when I, I did sort of my first job for like camp counselor and, uh, and then camp director, and I can tell you what's surprising is how many of those skills actually become relevant 
when you manage people later in life. Be um, careful, Jenny. I'm going to bring you into the other part of my life and you'll be talking to camp people. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Um, and uh, when I graduated from, from college, my father said, if you're really serious about being in the financial services business, you should go work in New York City. And so I did for a time, but I was in love and I uh, didn't want to stay there for a long time. So I did that for about a year. Um, and it was a great experience. I don't know that that's as important now as it was. I'm certain it's not. I think the world has dispersed a lot more so that you really can almost be anywhere and be absolutely engaged in the financial services industry. But back then it was a little less open. Um, and then I came in and worked for Franklin and uh, I did a lot of different jobs. Uh, I ran technology. We had a bank at one point. I ran the bank and the credit card business and auto financing, auto loans, giving to people who are buying cars loans. Um, and just, you know, try to do a lot of different things in the company, which helped me to understand the business better. And I always, you know, I always really loved the, what we do. So. Excellent. So talk a little bit more about what Franklin Templeton does. Um, you know, let's make sure that everyone on the call understands your business. So we help people achieve whatever the most important goals are in their lives. So for some people, that's just pure financial independence. They don't want to have to rely on somebody. They want to know that when they retire, that they, um, that they have enough money that they're not gonna get kicked out of their home. So they wanna make sure they're putting away every paycheck they put away a little bit uh, and to make sure that when that day comes that they'll be safe. Others um, might be wanting to put money away for education. They might wanna put it away for a, a master's degree or maybe to help their kids go to college and pay for some of those tuitions. And so they'll have that goal. Others may have a special needs child and they worry about when they're gone, who will be able to take care of that child and will there be enough money to ensure that that child is well taken care of. Um, and so whatever it is, people's individual, it can be, um, you know, I, my, my daughter's a singer and so she needed to, she wanted to put out an album. Uh, and so she needed, to, her goal was to be able to save enough money to be able to do the recording of the three songs that she just released on her album. So it, whatever goal it is, chances are there's a financial component. And so we take those, that money that people give to us to really take care for them and we invest it in places. And what does that mean? We invest it in places like the, the stock market or um, uh, you know, into bonds where you're, where you're providing uh, loans to people. Uh, and, and they get a return on that. And so they're able to you know, continue to see their savings grow more and more. And so our job is to make sure that we have the right investment solutions for our clients based on how risky they want to be. You know, some clients say, I'm all in, let's go for it. Others say, I couldn't live with a day where the market, you know, where I lost more than 10 cents for every dollar if the market went down. So be conservative. So we try to ma match people's goals um, both on their end goal of what they're trying to save for and also their risk profile in whatever kind of investment solutions we provide. Excellent. Thanks. That was really helpful for everyone, I'm sure. Um, so, you know, the industry has certainly evolved since you, um, since your grandfather started it and you were first interested when you were a child. What are some of the, the changes that you've seen over time um, and, and, you know, what, what do you think the impact of them has been? So interestingly, you have to go back to when mutual funds were sort of first created, which was like the 1920s. And, and because what was happening was only the rich people could invest in the stock market. And so if you weren't rich, but you had a little bit of money you wanted to save, you didn't have access to that because you didn't have enough money to buy a share. Uh, and you had to open an account, you had to have a certain money. And somebody came up with the idea, and, and, the, and sorry, and the danger was if you had enough money to invest in one share of stock or five shares of stock, and the company went down, you lost everything. So people realized that that, that was really dangerous. What you wanted to do was invest in a lot of different companies, but you didn't have enough money to be able to do that. So somebody came up and said, wait a second, if we all pool our money, we can invest in a lot of different companies and get diversification. One of the fundamental things people will say in an investment portfolio is you got to have diversification. 
So it had diversification when you pooled your money. They said, we need that. And then they said, um, well, what if I need to get my money every day? I have to have liquidity. I have to be able to, to, to get it out if I need it in case of emergency. So they built it for daily liquidity. And then they said, you know, I want it to be a reasonable price. And when they pooled the money, they got to negotiate deals like the big institutions could negotiate as far as their pricing. And so the, you know, that really kind of started out with the industry, which was trying to provide really good investment solutions for savings for you know, the middle America. And that has not changed. I have to say in my, since my grandfather until now, that has all stayed the same. What I think is changing is that you can not only invest to save money, but now you have things like, I want to improve. I want to see, I want to invest in companies that are more supportive of women. So gender equality. Uh, I want to, I want to, so when you build my portfolio, I want it to be diverse, but I want it to be rewarding those companies who are, are supportive of women. Or you might say, I'm really passionate about renewable energy. So um, I want, and, and, and I'm worried about climate change. So I want to only invest in companies that are improving their carbon footprint. So you can have these kind of overlays and technologies enabling it and the additional data is enabling it that you can not only invest for returns, but you can actually invest for good too, for whatever a personal passion is. And I think that that's evolved in the industry. Yeah, that's so interesting. And it leads me to a question based on something you said earlier, which is that one of the reasons you're so passionate about the industry is because of all the good that it can do. And um, I'm not sure that everyone understands that about the finance industry. I think sometimes it gets sort of a, you know, greed is good, Wolf of Wall Street um, image. And, um, you know, you and I both know that that's not true. But talk to us a little bit about where you see um, the positive uh, influences and impact of the industry and, and where those opportunities are. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I think there are bad actors in every profession, right? So I don't care if it's in the investment business, if it's doctors, if it's policemen, if it's politician, you're going to find bad actors everywhere. But the majority of the time, most people try to do good, right? I mean, I, I believe most people try to do good. And let's face it, it's way more, it's way better media story in the newspaper to talk about the bad people. Uh, and I think that's where the wolf of Wall Street, you know, how boring to go watch a movie where all they're doing is trying to help people save money, right? That doesn't make, Leo, <laughs> DiCaprio would not be into that movie, right? But I think it's really important. Um, and the reason I'm so passionate is that we don't do a good job as an industry of connecting the dots for people. So for example, we talked about why it's important to help people with the goals and their savings. I mean, and, and whether you want to be in the finance business, I, this world needs more women in the finance business because we have a tremendous amount of empathy, we're intuitive, and I think we do a good job of serving people. And so, so it's better for the industry to have it. But even if you don't want to be in the finance industry, you must learn about finances. My daughter right now is getting her master's at NYU, and she wants to be an actress. And she sits down with me to understand because guess what? If you're going to go into a movie or something, there's a lot of finances that go in there and she wants to understand it. So whatever time you can invest in it, no matter what career you want, I assure you it'll be time well spent. So back to why it gets me excited. So not only are we helping people achieve those really important goals for themselves, but the money that gets invested is what, the, is what creates a better standard of living uh, and an example of that right now is if you look at the three, four COVID vaccine companies, Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, AstraZeneca, they are all public companies. Their largest shareholders are big mutual fund companies like us or big pension funds. Uh, and, and so that means their shareholders are firemen, policemen, teachers. Those are the people who own these big companies. Everybody wants to say, oh, that big company's out for profit. Well, those big companies are owned by middle America. And it's really important that that happens. So when you have a crisis like what happens right now, that you're able to have these companies in place that have had some profits so they can reinvest 
and do R&D so that we can all be better off by the vaccines that are coming out. There's so many things that improve um, our standard of living because of companies that are basically owned by probably your parents. <laughs> so that's what makes me passionate about it. You have to have that connection. You have to have that savings to be able to support companies. And then those companies help improve because they build things that, that, that people need. So they help improve lives. Yeah. So building off of this idea of the finance world needing more women in it. And I recently heard, um, uh, I think it was on NPR, um, talk about women being more risk aware as opposed to risk averse and that that is something that makes them successful in investors. I like that, um, that turn of phrase because it just it, it has that shift from uh, being afraid. From, yeah, from being afraid being to being, exactly, yeah. Um, but we got a question from one of the students who's listening and she wants to know what advice you'd give a 16 year old trying to get a head start in the finance industry. So first thing I would say is do things like this, right? There, there actually are a lot of different organizations that are trying to educate and you can find so many things online that can even do a certain amount of self-study. I personally, I was just looking at something recently. I was like, what, let me remember what term insurance is. You know, you Google it and you get Investopedia comes up with a great description. So if you're motivated, then you can learn um, how to do it, which is a great start. And then try to get into, um, you know, summer internships. A lot of times they're held for college students, but if you can get into those, those are great. And I actually always had my kids do, I know you guys are in high school, so you're probably old for this, but I used to have them do a lemonade stand because I wanted them to understand. And I'd say, this is how much it costs for the lemons, right? And this is how much it costs, and we're gonna add for the sugar. And this is how much it costs, right? And, and we're gonna put these, and by the way, you're gonna spend you know two hours to earn your $6 or whatever. They have to make that connection, but I can assure you that the same things that it takes to build a lemonade stand are actually the things that it takes to, to run a company. You have cost of goods, right? You have, what does it cost you to put those things in? You got a lot of people's time working on it. And then you got marketing. So there's good signs out there on the street convincing people to come in. Um, but I know that sounds a little silly, but any kind of opportunity to put yourself in a situation where you're seeing how a business runs. When I ran um, our auto finance uh, company, it was a teeny little company. I have to this day on my path coming to be CEO, would say that that was the most valuable training of all the jobs I had because it didn't matter that it was a little company or a big company, it had the same problems. And so if you have an opportunity to work even in little companies, but to, to be open, ask questions, there's never a, st a stupid question, be fearless about the questions, you will learn so much. And always try to put yourself in the shoes of the, sh of the client, right? How, what are they thinking? What motiv motivates them? And then also, of the boss of the company, you have to you know try to think about both sides, uh, and I think you'd be surprised at how much you'd learn. And yeah. the other, I'm going to make one other thing. I know none of you are thinking about this, but um, I, I oftentimes end up talking to women who are going through a divorce, and they're fearful as it happens around trying to understand for the first time taking over their finances. And what I always say to them is, go with your instinct. You actually understand this better than you think. So don't let anybody talk you out of or talk down to you. Just ignore it. Just ask those questions because your instinct will drive you to the right answer. Yeah, that's great advice too. And actually that's um, what some of the research from some financial literacy centers shows us is that the, the issue for women is not knowledge, it's confidence. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, so another question that we got ahead of time, which uh, I think, plays off of nicely off of the lemonade stand is um, really about your personal financial success and how do you set yourself up for that starting in high school? What are some things um, that our girls can be thinking about to, um, to start building for themselves? So we do some, um, we do some studies in, on you know, people's saving and how do you get to retirement savings? And one of the things which I think is so important is if you take somebody, hold on, in a, in a COVID moment, my son in college is here with a bunch of friends and my door is open, it's quite loud. So let me close this. That's what happens. You're always a mother no matter what when you work. Yep. 
<laughs> um, wait, where was I on the, uh, what was the? Uh, setting, you, setting yourself okay, up for so personal. So what, yeah. For retirement, um, if you put $5,000 a year away for 10 years between the age of 25 and 35, and you just leave it in there investing and compounding. So the 5,000 now is 5,500. And the next year you make a 10% on the 5,500. So that's the compounding, right? You will have more money at retirement than a person who doesn't do it, doesn't start until they're 35. And they put $5,000 a year away for 30 years. So 10 years starting early is more valuable than 30 years starting later. So the best thing you can do if you are working, take some number, if you can pull 10% out of whatever you earn and put it away in, in an investment account. And now in, when I was growing up, you couldn't actually you know, open a stock account or, or things like that. Nowadays, it's easier to do with less money. You need your parents to sign off until you're 18. But, and just have the discipline of every time you get money, putting that 10% away, it will be astonishing how much you actually uh, save and generate over time. And it's that kind of discipline that is really important. Yeah, compound interest, the eighth wonder of the world. Yes. <laughs> so um, what are the skills and qualities that you think employers are looking for right now? What, um, what do you think it takes to succeed? So I think, you know, <laughs> I always say that First of all, this is what I was taught by my father, right, was persistence, not being afraid to try. If it doesn't work out, dust yourself off and get back in the game and try again, right? You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So one is the amount of persistence. Two is collaboration. Be, be somebody who is willing to help others out, whether you see a personal benefit yourself, right? You have to be, you know, any team player, that isn't playing for the team and is just playing for themselves will never be successful in any sport. Well, the same thing goes for working in a company, be a team player in that company. Be curious, try to understand the business from, I would say, read the annual report that believe me, they're really dry and boring, but they will tell you what's on the CEO's mind. Um, but be curious beyond what you just do every day. Like understand how you do it and think about, is there a better way to do it? Can I come up with a better way? Listen, some of the greatest innovation, probably most of the greatest innovation comes from our people who are doing the jobs, right? Because they're gonna be the ones who just say, this is really inefficient, there's a better way. So be that person who's coming up with those kind of ideas. Um, and then the thing that women have the hardest time doing is putting your hat in the ring for the next opportunity, right? We expect, to be having proven that we can do every part of a job before we take a job. Men might be able to do 10 or 15% and they're gonna sell you on why they should have an opportunity to do 100%. So don't be that person. Don't, be a, don't talk yourself out of a job. My friend, Stacy Cunningham, who's the CEO of the New York Stock Exchange, tells the story about when she was working for the CEO at the time. He came to her and he said, I think I'm gonna do something else do you have any ideas about somebody who could be the CEO? And she thought about it for a while. She said, let me get back to you. I'm, I'm thinking about it. She talked to some people that had their ideas. And one, finally, one of her friends said, Stacy, he's asking you if you want to be the CEO. Are you ready to lean in and be the CEO? And when she went back to him, he said, no, Stacy, you don't have the confidence yet. You, you didn't immediately say you were ready. So she didn't, she didn't get that job then. And then he came back later and he said, Stacy, do you have any, uh, any ideas about anybody? She says, I'm ready. I'd like to take that job. And that's when she got the job. So don't let yourself be the one to talk out, right? Worst case is you don't get the job. Who cares? Um, but, but put your hat in to try to do it. It's amazing how much that stretch can, can help you out. So what's something you've, you've thrown your hat in the ring for and, um, and missed or, um, you know, a, a mistake that you've made, something that, um, you know, that, that you really wanted to succeed at but didn't? So I, um, I put my hat in the ring early on for a role running um, part of our operations and I didn't get the job and I was crushed, crushed. 
And so then I ended up um, running our credit card division in our bank. And um, I can't tell you how much I learned. It was such a great experience. I mean, maybe I would have learned more doing the other thing. But today, I think of all the things I learned when I ran the credit card business, that was phenomenal. So, you know, sometimes you don't get the job, um, but another great opportunity comes around. And, and probably part of it is that you just make it a great opportunity. Uh, and then I would say that the time that I kind of felt like I failed at something and really had to struggle, uh, when I was running our auto business, we made some mistakes early on and, and had some losses that were really hard um, to, to kind of deal with. And I remember we had some regulatory problems with the government coming at us. And, and I remember waking up at times thinking, how am I going to get out of bed and do today? Like, I, I just, I didn't want to face it. I kind of lie in the field position and think, I just one foot in front of the other. And you know what? Sometimes at the hardest times, that's all you have in you is one foot in front of the other. But at least when you're doing that, you're moving forward. So never at any time in your life, when you hit those low blocks, just think today, I'm just going to keep putting one foot in front of the other and see where it goes. In the end, uh, we were able to turn that business around. Uh, and, and it was honestly, it's probably my, one of the things I'm most proud about in my career was sticking with it and being able to turn around and be successful. Yeah, I think it really is true. Um, and I think I heard you say this in, a, in another interview that, um, you know, the, the only thing about failure that's really failing is not learning from it. You said it more eloquently than I just did, but, <laughs> true, right? but it really is true. You know, if you don't take those opportunities, you know, if you look at, um, I'm still in the land of little kids. So if you look at toddlers, right? Like they fall down when they're learning to walk and they get right back up because that's the only way to learn how to walk. You know, I, I learned, um, um, you know, that the WD-40, the, the mm -hmm. lubricant trick, that was the 40th try. That's why it's called WD-40. <laughs> there we go. I didn't know that. That's, yeah, right? That's amazing. Um, so similar lines, because I, I think that this is just so helpful for our, our high school and, um, and young, our high school girls and our young women. Um, you know, I think oftentimes when you're in high school and you're thinking about what comes afterwards, maybe it's college, maybe it's something else, you feel like these choices that you're making are really life-defining. You know, they really are going to be who you are for a long time. Are there, can you remember a choice that you made at some point where you really thought like, this is, this is like a huge part of my life and, you know, how did it turn out? Um, I, I guess I, I always felt like you get, you know, if you make a choice, the reality is one is you got to give the best of it. Um, and so that you try to get the most out of it, but I don't know that I never felt, well, if I make this choice, boy, I'm locked in here forever. Like I always felt like I, there would be optionality. And I think that's true. Uh, the one choice that I, that was really a kind of a life to find, <laughs> it wasn't, turned out it wasn't, but I thought it might be. Well, maybe it isn't. Um, is that I, ha I have five kids. So I had four kids uh, pretty quickly. There were four children, six and under. And as my fourth one says, who is the actress at NYU, uh, she reminds her siblings that mom and dad wanted them, but God wanted her because uh, she came as a bit of a surprise. Uh, and, and I didn't feel totally done for whatever reason, um, but I also thought I needed to get an MBA for my career. And I didn't have an MBA at that time. And so I was on the fence really deciding it's got to be one or the other. Actually, a friend of mine said, look, if you're on the fence on having a child, uh, you'll, never, you'll never regret having one, but you'll... you'll, you'll um, you might regret not having one. And I thought to myself, well, when is one answer guaranteed to make you okay? And I ended up having him. And to be honest, and, and part, of, part of it may be because of I'm in a family business, but for me, the MBA ended up not being that important. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have my loud, terrific son who's uh, downstairs making with his buddies. Um, <laughs> they, they can't be at college, so they've coalesced and made this college for them. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Oh, that's great. Well, so it sounds like that's a, a real compromise that you made in your, in your life, um, you know, between family and work. Are there other places where you, um, 
where you feel like you've made a, a compromise um, and, um, you know, sort of why, why did you take, make the choice that you made? Yeah, I mean, I, here's how I handled, um, you know, let's see, when you, you do a job like mine with, with employees across the globe, you know, you spend a lot of time at work. So first of all, you better love it. Like I would say, do what you love, because if you're not passionate about what you do, you're never going to be great at it because there's going to be somebody else who's passionate and they're going to be great at it. And you're just going to be okay. They try reasonably hard. Um, so, you know, with that, there are times you definitely make sacrifices on your personal life. What I tended to do is when there was a dilemma, when there was a conflict for time, I tended to, to try to think of myself five years ahead, looking back and thinking which of those choices will be more important for me. Um, and often that gave me clarity about where to spend my time. Mm. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, so we have a, another question from one of our girls, and her question is, um, if there's a book you'd recommend to a teenager to learn more about financing or managing, um, and I would be curious about that, and then I'd be curious in general, you know, um, are there books that you've been reading, media you've been consuming that you feel like um, has been really impactful for you? Um, <laughs> so I tend to read a lot of either history, mostly I read a lot of history books. So I, I actually can't think of a finance book right now off the top of my head because I haven't read one in a while. I just finished Walter Isaacson's The Code Breaker, uh, Jennifer Dowda, and I can't remember the other woman's name, who um, came up with the gene editing that was so critical mm, yeah. to the vaccine professor at UC Berkeley. Fantastic book, really, really great. Maybe a little thick for high school. Um, there is a great, great book for women that I think you guys should read because they're only uncovering these things now uh, called A Woman of No Importance. And uh, it's about a f American spy who um, she was, she had a limp from an injury who was, an, uh, was a spy in World War II and probably one of the most effective spies, she actually spied for England because nobody could imagine that a woman with a limp could be that effective at what she was doing. So she was able to go through places and have access because of the unconscious bias people have um, about, uh, about should, should a woman be in this role? And you can use that to your advantage, right? Uh, and they're actually just now uncovering more and more stories of where women were really, uh, really effective and important and sort of got buried in history for a variety of, of reasons. Um, but that, I found it to be a really, a really uh, great read. Oh, excellent. Um, have you always been a history buff? I probably became a history buff after college. So I'm a slow reader. Uh, and so I think that in, in college history was overwhelming to me because it, of the amount of reading you have to do. Now I get to do it. I, audiobooks has been the greatest thing for me <laughs> uh, because I can yeah. speak up it and, and, and consume it a lot, lot, lot more often when I'm yeah. exercising or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're that it, they're uh, they're really great to have on car rides and, yeah. and things like that for sure. Um, excellent. So um, I'm I'm curious, um, you know, in thinking about the. Um, the time that you've spent in the industry are there um how do you how do you think about um women in the industry and diversity and inclusion in the industry um kind of at large you know you talked about the importance of having more women in this industry which obviously i completely agree with you um but i'm curious as the ceo of a company you know where um What's the business case? You know, what's the sort of um, motivation for you? So diverse, diversity of thought. I mean, it's been, first of all, it's intuitive, but it's also been proven. Diversity of thought enables you to, um, to have better, to solve problems better, right? And so I, I love telling the story. It's a camp counselor story. My daughter was a camp counselor. And, um, and they were doing a trivia thing and they asked, what's the capital of Maine? And this little 
I mean, six-year-old girl raises her hand and they're thinking, wow, she knows the capital me. That's impressive. And she goes, it's M, right? And, and so he <laughs> thinks about that. But, but think about that. Believe me, M was pounded out of every first grader's mind from that moment forward, right? So you have just lost, if you only put people in that age group, you would have lost that kind of answer, right? And so it's just an example of people's diverse views. And so the problem is, and this is where social media is a problem. Let's face it. We love to talk to people who agree with us. It makes us feel really smart. But that is not a good, healthy environment. So, so as a leader, what you want is to be able to encourage healthy debate where people can be comfortable with different views and that they're not afraid of having different views. I think that's really important. Um, so that's the first thing. So how do you get there? You know what? Like anything else, it's bottoms up. You start, you, you do programs like this. That's why I'm you know, thankful I get a chance to talk to all of you. I hope that you can imagine yourself in this great industry um, and that you're attracted to it because the industry will be better served having people like you in it. Um, but you, you, you get girls to see themselves as being part of the industry. You make sure that when you're recruiting, you're reaching out in a way that resonates to girls. I mean, when my daughter said, I want to you know, I want to be in an industry that helps somebody. I would explain to her why this helps somebody. So we need to be on college campuses talking so that that can resonate with people. And then once you bring in diverse groups, you need to measure, are you retaining them? Are they having opportunity for promotion? Are, you know, what's their experience? That means you have to listen to people. We have, we have six, what we call business resource groups. So we have the Black Empowerment Network, LGBTQ, Ola, the Hispanic women, veterans. Um, and so I'll spend time and ask them, how's it going for you? How's the experience within the firm? It's really important that you hear what truth is and that you're willing to hear it. And that way you're going to be able to retain people. It's not just enough to attract people to the industry. You also have to make them feel included so that they want to stay in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. I think that leads to a great question around mentors and role models. And I'm curious um, who in your life has filled those roles um, and um, you know what you've gained from them and how you've sought them out. I think that that's something that women can really benefit from is figuring out, you know, how do I find that mentor, sponsor, role model in my life? So I was fortunate in that I would have to say the two people most influential were my parents. My mother had seven children and said to my dad, I want to go back to college because she had dropped out to marry him. Uh, and, I, and she ultimately graduated from Stanford Medical School as one of only 10 women to graduate from there. This was in the 1970s. Um, so I had, I always say I'm a second generation working, guilty working mom. And then my father, who always had the view of, you know, you take care of the client and the business takes care of itself. Treat everybody fa you know, fairly. I was always raised with the golden rule treat everybody as you'd like them to treat you. Uh, and, and if you can, you know, work with people in a firm and everybody feels like it's fair, um, it makes a big difference to the culture of a company. So I would say that that was most significant in kind of um, developing me. And I, you know, I had kids, so I was a little bit busy. Since my children have grown, I am a, I'm an introvert who had to learn to be an extrovert mm -hmm. to do the job that I'm doing. Um, and so it was harder for me, but I started to reach out to people in the industry um, and just kind of introduce myself, which is a big risk, right? Remember, that's the part of being fearless, just saying, hey, um, I'd love to just talk to you. Do you mind? And, and I built a really great network of women and friends uh, and men uh, by, by being willing to have somebody say, no, I don't have time for you and not take that personally. Uh, because most of the time people are willing to do it. And so I would say, um, you know, through organizations like this, there are programs that try to match women with, with or girls with mentors so they can get more experience and exposure. And I can tell you, I know within our firm, um, you know, I think Tiffany Hong's on. I know she does a lot of programs like that. There are, there are a lot of women who really make a point of trying to mentor uh, girls to, to come into this industry. Yeah. So um, sort of similar to that, one of our girls wanted to know um, about tips on how to network with high profile people and sort of how do you, you know, what do you think about in your elevator pitch? What's, what's some advice around both of those things? 
Well, so I, I think if you're, you know, one is if it's a planned engagement and another is um, an unplanned engagement. Unplanned engagement, part of that is just to be bold enough to introduce yourself, like bold enough to introduce and say, and I'm really, I know what you do and I, you know, I just really appreciate it. I'd love to talk to you at some point. And, and maybe the CEO will say, no, I don't have, but I'll match you with somebody that would be able to talk to you or whatever. Um, but chances are they're not going to just in, ignore you, right? So that, that would be one. And then in the case where you know what the person's doing, try to understand a bit of the background so that you can ask questions that are relevant to whatever their career. How did you make this decision, right? How did you, I know you, in your career, you went from A to B, you know, what, what was kind of doing your thinking at that? Everybody loves to talk about their self, themselves. So if you have some questions, you know, it ends up, uh, I, I think you'll get people responding pretty, pretty positively. Do you find that you spend um, sort of um, social time, but thinking about, you know, your career um, and whatnot with folks who are in your industry? Or do you find that you look for, um, for resources uh, in people outside your industry? Where do you feel like there's, um, you know, you Meaning draw from your a, influence from? From a, from a, specifically from a work networking or just life in general? No, just life in general. Like, where do you feel like you, you mean, you you mentioned Stacey Cunningham. Uh, I know you're friends with one of our past speakers, SUNY Harford. Um, you know, are those the people that you find you spend sort of some of your precious social time with as well? Because that, you have so much in common or do you look for other places um, sort of to that diversity of thought piece? Yeah, no, I mean, my, my best friend from high school is still my best friend. So I, I still have a, a lot of friends from high school, you know, great friends from college uh, that I still spend time with. And then I have uh, friends that I met usually like a SUNY through a work environment, but we've just built a friendship with it. So I would say I'm pretty spread out um, yeah. across the board. Yeah, I think it's great to have sort of different places you get you um, you fill your bucket from. Yeah. Um, so we are almost at um, our time together. I want to ask you one last question, um, just in sort of wrapping up as you think about trends in the industry that you think um, our high school girls might find interesting, and and um, you know even outside the industry, just sort of what you're seeing in business. Well, we are we are living in. Uh, an industrial revolution. I think all of you are living it so you never experienced life without it, but the pace of change that these technology innovations and the data revolution that's going on is going to significantly change every business. I'm on the board at um, Lucille Packard, which is Stanford uh, University's uh, uh, child uh, pediatric uh, hospital. Um, I think we're 20 years from now, we're gonna look back at medicine and think, boy, they were you know, using blunt instrument. It was archaic, right? Because I think the, 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 the kind of breakthroughs that we're gonna have in medicine the next 20 years are gonna be unbelievable. That's happening in technology. It's gonna happen in our industry. Um, and so I actually think it's a really exciting time to be young when you're not afraid and intimidated by it because you're curious and thinking about new ways that you can do things. Um, but a lot of people have been in these industries for a long time. It's, it's a little bit intimidating. Um, you know, I think that's part of what makes it exciting, but I think it's, uh, uh, I think it's an interesting time for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trouble you for one more question because it just came in the Q and A and, um, I don't know if this will, um, you know, I don't know what you'll have for this, but um, one of our girls says, I have my own small e-commerce business. How do I market my products online? Um, it's a really uh, interesting question. Yeah, so um, apparently, and I only know this because my partner has, uh, has a law firm and, and so does some of this online. I've never done it because I, because our marketing department does it. But apparently Google has these kind of education things about how you can do some marketing. And let's face it, the world now, it's, you, you have these influencers um, that if they back your product, uh, you know, they get paid some little amount. So there's, there's um, it's, believe me, it's a different world than I know. Uh, I just know on the surface that you have to kind of 
again, this is one of those things where you dive in and, you know, if you can get involved in, in Facebook too, I know Facebook does it and Google does it, uh, where you can kind of learn how to do the, the marketing online, leveraging their programs and being able to connect with these influencers in Instagram and other things. So yeah, that's probably the best I can give you. <laughs> I think that's great advice. I find marketing to be one of those things that you sort of think is simple and some of the concepts are, but it's really very complicated. It's really, I mean, it is not in my wheelhouse. But, I'm but this so, is your perfect example, right? Like, so don't be afraid to fail. Like, go try right. it, you know? You yep. just, it'll cost you a little bit of money to do it, which is hard when you're in high school. Um, but, but, you know, or you use, you know, ask your friends to help yep. you network and share, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. But don't be afraid of doing it wrong because you're not yeah. doing it wrong. Right, right. And I think that's a lot of what so much of the innovation we've seen in the last few years is, is just people trying things that I think 15 years ago, someone would have thought they were absolutely nuts, like influencers on social, right? I mean, who would have thought that, and the amount of business it drives is really fascinating. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So any, um, any sort of final thoughts for our girls or um, anything you want to leave them with? Well, first of all, this is a great industry and we'd love for you to be a part of this industry. So that's number one. Number two, you've taken the first step just by participating in a, in a program like this. It, you know, that takes a lot of effort to carve out your time. So that's like huge as far as, uh, you know, heading on that path uh, to, to become part of this, this industry because it's about just getting comfortable. Um, and again, I think it's a, it's a we, we need you. We need more women. Women control 80% of spending. 70 plus percent of women will at some point in their life have to be the primary financial person. You know, take advantage of no, and, and just learn about it. So anyway, it's yeah. really great. I, thank you. Jenny, thank you so much for giving us your time and um, your thoughts on the industry and your career and, and what our girls can be thinking about. We're so appreciative to you and to Franklin Templeton for sharing the, the time with us. And I'll look forward to us getting to have more conversations and um, hope our, our organizations can do some more partnering. Terrific. Thank you. Take care, Excellent. everybody, and be safe. Yes, thank you all so much for joining us. Be safe and um, enjoy the rest of your evening.